What is up, everyone? Welcome to episode two of Links to Labels. I am joined by John Madera, the founder of Buena Gente Golf. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to John, and I'm going to have him tell, uh, tell you guys a little bit about himself and his background. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks, Clayton, for, uh, for reaching out. Um, I've, I'm, I've been looking forward to, to, to have this conversation with you, so um, this is cool. This is exciting. Um, my name is John Madera. I started Buena Gente, I would say, around August 2022. And that actually was a spinoff of Buena Gente brand. So the idea behind Buena Gente brand was to do designs for apparel that, you know, would appeal to not just a Latino audience, but more of a, you know, people that like the stuff that I like. I like the old school salsa music. I, I would I would say, you know, it's my dad's music. That's the type of music I like. And so, you know, things that would reflect um, the culture, um, phrases, salsa songs, you know, um, sayings, things like that, or chorus snippets of a song, um, and really cool little illustrations of, of singers or, you know, areas of Latin America. And um, I started noticing, yeah, you know, that, that got some really good traction. And I was all in on Buena Gente brand. And over time, you know, I moved from the Bay Area over here. And by the way, you know, I've been designing for, you know, I studied design, graduated uh, 2004 um, with with uh, a degree in graphic design, and so I started going into the digital realm where it's you know all digital visual design work. Then I started doing digital products, but I always like creating you know illustrations, uh, doing design work like that. And I thought you know there's so many cool things out there for other audiences. There's nothing really for someone like me that likes the things that I like and I'm able to represent it or be this walking billboard for the interests that I have. So that's why I started uh, Buena Gente Brand. But once I moved from the Bay Area over here, um, it was just like, I don't know, a light bulb went off. And I was like, man, you know what? Let me do a little digging. And I started looking through, um, you know, started doing a little bit of research, light research, or some would call it desk research. Uh, in my field of work, and um, I didn't really see a lot of uh, apparel out there for um, the underrepresented golfers, right? And um, that's when I called somebody that I met in this area that does, you know, he's launched a few brands. And I said, dude, I got this idea. I didn't even have the logo yet. And he was like, let's get cracking. Let's do it. Um and then one day I was just thinking, I like to do things very different. I didn't want to do the, the usual, you know, country club style logo or just the script. And I wanted to do something that would be impactful, something that represented what I wanted to do, um, which was uh, bring, <laughs> this happens to me all the time during, during meetings, <laughs> um, bring some of that, that, um, you know, that culture, some of our vibe to to the golf world and kind of mix it in somehow. And that's that was the idea behind the the grip logo. I had my kid take a picture of me, you know, just holding up the hands like this, and then went over it and, and procreate, put it out there. That was my first post. Um and then from that first post, people were like, yo, what is this? Like and that guy that I had reached out to, he was like, bro, let's get this on shirts. Um, and, you know, it just took off from there. Um, five months later, I was in the PGA show with a little booth um, with a bunch of prototypes. And, you know, the the response was was really, really, really good. So I knew I had something here that I was working with. Yeah, quick question. You mentioned the PGA show. I'm I'm going this year and I know they do this, like, you know, pitch right? This pitch thing where you can pitch your ideas, whether it's a small brand or, you know, not a brand at all. You ever considered doing something like that at the PGA show? Since you do have a pretty, you know, unique niche with who you're targeting, but yeah. the products you sell really do appeal to everyone. 
which I think is super unique with what you do. And it's hard to do when you're creating apparel for a niche, right? Yeah. Is get others on board. And I think what you do really well is you have a clear niche, a clear target market, uh, a clear brand identity, but it appeals to everyone. You know, the designs appeal to everyone. And so in my opinion, I think your brand can grow really big. And I know we chatted about, you know, that next step for growth, you need that money. Has that ever been something you've considered doing some sort of pitch at the PGA show or something like it? Yeah. Um, I did last year. I couldn't do anything. I, I, I was literally glued to my booth. Um, and so from my understanding, if I remember properly, anything you do in PGA, in the PGA show, you have to pay extra for it. So even just the pitch in front of somebody, you have to pay extra for that, right? I imagine hundreds and hundreds of brands and, and all of them saying, yeah, I want I want a chance to pitch. Um, there was an, an area to display, you know, your products. You have to pay for that, like everything. And I, I barely made it, bro, barely made it. And so with that, it was really successful. But I do appreciate what you said that it, um, you know, it appeals to a larger audience because that really, you know, after time, actually at the PGA show, that's when I started noticing that, right? There were people coming up to my booth, all types of people um, saying, I bought your sweater um, because at the time, that's all I had, sweaters and T-shirts. And they were like, we bought your sweater. Um, there was an, an Asian couple that came by my booth and said, we bought like six of your sweaters. I was like, you guys are the ones. So it was nice to put a, a face on on all the orders. Um, and and um, a, a buddy of mine, we be, we become really um, good, good uh, friends through Instagram was like, Indian guy was like, I bought your sweater only because I saw a brown hand. You know, and I was like, I need to have that. I was like, dude, that that's that's those are really good quotes, right? It helps me see and understand that I could appeal to a larger audience. And um I've been going recently through this through this really weird stage where I'm like, do I want to shed the Latino only thing? Do I want to appeal to all and say this is a uh a Latin owned brand, but anybody and everybody's good people, that's what Buena Gente means. Um but you can't be everything for everyone. Um, I think I might have posted this a while back on social media. I'm reading a book called The Buddha and the Badass, and it talks about you don't want to, you don't want everybody to love you, and you can't have everybody hate you. So you don't, you don't want to be in the middle. You don't want to be in that in that middle point where you're you're trying to to, to appeal to everybody, right? It's, you're going to be one or the other, and. Um, I'm, I'm I'm currently at that point, right, where I'm like, do I go all in on just Latinos, the, you know, underserved, underrepresented group, or is this something for everyone? But yeah, I kind of rambled there a little bit. Sorry about that. I went away from your PGA show uh, question. <laughs> no, I, I think that that is a important topic. And I think something a lot of people have to deal with, maybe not specifically yeah. that issue of like, trying to focus on, you know, that core target demographic or expand, but trying to determine where their focus is and how they grow next. Yeah. You know, I would say that I really like the brands that have a good story and have a very targeted demographic that they go after. Um, I have to imagine the Latin golf community is much bigger than people realize. And if you just appeal to the it's Latin golf community, you'd probably be really successful. Um, mm -hmm. But like we talked about, um, you know, Eastside Golf, right? It's more of a brand for that black culture and appealed to those underrepresented in that culture. And now that that brand has not just appealed to that culture, but really everyone as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you could take that same approach, right? Where you, yeah. you, your identity is that Latin inspired brand and you're bringing your flavor to your brand, but that can still appeal, you know, yeah. to everyone, right? That's and I think that that is what I think is most interesting, especially... You hear Landforce. I'm sure you follow Colin, right? Um, another mm. Oregon guy. He always talks about oh, Moose Down. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah uh, I don't. I don't know if he's in Portland or Corvallis or some okay. one of those, but yeah, Oregon guy. Um, he always talks about niching down, right? And yeah. I think there's multiple ways to do that. You can do that with like who are you targeting, what products you're bringing to the table, 
Um, those are just two things you can do. And I think your niche is obviously your demographic. And I think you have a good opportunity based on what other Latin brands are out there, which I'm not, you know, there are some, but none that I think put out products and have a strong story and brand identity and a strong logo as Buena Gente, um, which actually takes me back to what I was going to ask when you were talking about that logo and how really that started everything. Yeah. I was trying to build a brand with a buddy a while back and we were playing around with logos and we were just on Canva um, and uh, Photoshop, Canva and PowerPoint, right? Thinking yeah. we could do it. We don't need to pay a graphic designer. And then eventually we kind of were just like, let's just spend the, I forget how much we spent. We got some guy who was getting his master's degree in design or something like that. And he was taking projects on the side. So we got it relatively cheap because we did meet with someone else who gave us a price where we we're like, no, we yeah. cannot pay that right now. Yeah. Um, and what we realized is like, we told him what we wanted it to get to, for it to convey, right. What the brand that we were trying to build meant uh, the story. And it was like a hundred degrees better than what we could ever do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Like having a logo that basically, you know, you, you have the long form, you have the short form, right? Like yeah. the caricature, kind of like the hands for you. Right. Um, yeah. Where that right there tells a story, you know, and we couldn't put something like that together. So what I want to know is like, what was your logo design process? I'm sure there were many iterations. I'm sure it took time. I think some people think you can just go online on uh, Canva find one of the templates that they have, put your name yeah. in it, and, and now you got a logo. When in reality, like the logo is so much more important to a brand than yeah. people even think, realize. Sure, sure. Um, the logo, well, <clears throat> a lot of people refer to it as a logo. I even did in the beginning of the, the, the our conversation. I honestly see it more as a graphic um, because logos are, are supposed to be very, very simple. Um, you could identify it from a, a mile away. You can convert it to black and white and you know what it is, right? Um, just a monochromatic way. Um, uh, what is it? A monochromatic format. And then you can see what it is exactly. Um, so for me, it represents everything that I was going for, which is the brown hand with jewelry. It's kind of that, that boldness, that um, liveliness and, and that culture that I'm trying to, well, I'm not trying to do it. That's something that I'm trying to be careful with. I'm not doing a movement that wasn't already created, but rather I want to be something people can, can look to and say, okay, this reflects who I am. This is who I am. Right. Um, and so, the meaning behind doing the the interlock a lot of people just the other day i was at a golf course and somebody was like i like your logo i'd buy it but that's not my grip and i'm like that's that's not the point of the logo right or you know not only people with the interlock grip should be getting it it's it's really a, a mixture right having those two hands um clasp is really the mixture of two cultures together, right? There's there's the brown hand, and then there's the white glove that represents the sport of golf. The, the white uh, glove that represents the people that make the decisions. So, just showing how both of these worlds could mix together, and you know, not really create any havoc. Or we're not. I'm not here trying to disturb anything or change any rules. You know, I'm not trying to be a rebel or anything. It's just like, we've been here, you know, Latinos have been playing golf for a really long time as well. I, I'm, I'm not one to say or claim like, oh yeah, well, I'm bringing in this new wave or this new audience of people. No, by no means. Um, it's just like, you know, we can coexist, right? Um, and that for me, the, the, the hands say a lot, you know? Um, and when you look at it, a lot of people have different interpretations of it. And that's what I like. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, uh, it was really telling a story and having or doing something very, very impactful. Um, and I think that it, it does that, right. It's like people see it and they're like, shoot, aha, people follow me. And then minutes later say the logo's sick. Like it's the first thing that they say. So I know that, you know, it's, it, it's doing its job. It's, it's creating a reaction at, at the moment that people see it, you know? And I also think what people don't realize, though, is it's it's like the power of that design or that logo. There's so many brands out there 
that we're all very familiar with, we see and use every single day where you don't need to see the full length logo. You could see that symbol that they use and you know immediately that's Coke, that's Pepsi, that's yeah. GM, right? And I think with your hand symbol, that's one of those things where eventually people will see that and make one hand thing, right? Yeah. And I don't think people understand the importance of just being able to recognize brands and, and the value that that has with a solid logo like that. Um, so I think Thanks. the moral of the story is for brands that, you know, may be listening or not, or someone that wants to start a brand, right. Is that it's an important step of building sure. your brand, especially early in the process. I think some people are like, we can just change our logo. You know, we can update it later when in reality, it's like, if you can focus on that early, you can really help. I think create a perception of a higher quality brand. If you have a higher quality logo or a design that represents your brand that people can relate to. Um, but what I wanted to get at next was in your answer, you mentioned, you know, not specifically, but community. And I know that like your brand represents the underrepresented the Latino golf community. And so I spoke about this with Jimmy Tropicana in my last podcast, but the importance of community for your brand and how brands like yours specifically, um, it's unique because not only can people relate to the story, but they can also relate to designs. They can relate to you, right? As you know, someone who is Latino and it makes them feel like buying your product and wearing their product puts them in sort of this community of others that can, that they relate to or, you know, see themselves uh, in others. And so what I want to understand or what I want to know from you is how important is building that community to you and you know, the brand long-term? Um, it's important now. It wasn't, it wasn't top of mind when I started this. My approach was com the complete opposite where I said, all right, I know some brands or not even brands, right? There's, there's um, groups that start out small and they build the community over time. And the idea behind this was I want to go straight to the, to the pro shops, clubs, you know, I want to be in stores. And that way, when somebody walks into a store, say, oh, shoot, buena gente. Like, this is the only brand here I see that is in Spanish. Or this is the only brand I see here that's a bit different from everything else. And that be the way that people uh, learn about or, or find out about the brand and then kind of like work my way in, like almost reverse, right? There's people that build communities or like um, groups. And then it starts that, that, that the word starts spreading and it grows over time. And I just kind of wanted to take that inside out approach or, you know, outside in approach, go to the stores first, get my, my products in there. And for people that go to those, that's what I want to create the whole lifestyle, like streetwear stuff. That's what sells out quick. But that wasn't my original intention. I didn't want to create sweaters and T-shirts with the graphic on it. I wanted to create polos that people wear on the course, like the more formal wear. I'm, I'm more into that stuff. So flash forward to now, talking to some folks, they're like, dude, community is where it's at. You need to create a community. But I feel like that's been it's been organically taking shape over time. It's like people feel that by buying a. Uh, an, an item they're like oh shoot i have something that represents me and now i represent them it's it's really weird it happened organically i didn't plan it that way but i i absolutely love it. and i could tell again by the the comments by the messages i get the, the dms it's like dude i got my my polo i got my sweater um so happy to that somebody that looks like me is doing this um so happy we have something right and, you know, other comments where it's like, I used to support this brand, but now that's that I see a brand that reflects my culture, my personality, like I'm going to go all in on this. So it's really cool. I feel like this community is organically taking shape. And of course, you know, by launching this, the ambassador program, got a few, few guys that are that are also kind of, you know, spreading the word for me, creating smaller pockets of community in their areas, you know, in LA and Sacramento and VA. So it's, it's really, really cool. But, yeah. but you know, to, 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 to answer your question, I didn't, I didn't plan that. I don't plan anything like nothing. 
<laughs> like people may think like, oh, he's doing this. It's like but strategically, I haven't planned anything, you know? Yeah, I, I think that that's unique. I think there's different approaches too. You can be really strategic, really planned out, or you can kind of just figure it out as you go, right? Yeah. And I don't necessarily think there's a, any one right way to do it. I do think when you get to a certain level of growth, you need to be more strategic and planned for about, sure. yeah, about sure. that. But I think at the beginning, like unless, you know, there's different ways to grow, right? I, I think we've spoke about this where I told you about that baseballism story. They're a Portland brand. And I'm sure some people listening will know what baseballism is, but they're an off the field baseball apparel brand. And I worked with them when I was in grad school, um, interned with them, led, uh, started their influencer program, managed that for a while. So I was able to work with them and see them, you know, grow at a certain stage. But one thing that I really admired about them was how they started. And long story short, there are four buddies. They went to Oregon together, University of Oregon. They played on the club baseball team. They had a baseball camp there called Baseballism, right? Mm -hmm. They all went their separate ways after college. Um, one of them was a baseball instructor, wore his Baseballism camp t-shirt. Pa parents were saying, oh, that's a cool shirt. Where do you like, where do you get that? You know what I mean? And yeah. so... He kind of was like, I have an idea, guys. Like, let's bring, like, let's try to, you know, sell some shirts. And I don't know how it all started or when it all started. I don't know the full story. But what I do know is that before they ever sold a product, they were, they had a group. I think it was a group on Facebook. And a lot of what they would do is like, a, it was a group called Baseballism. They would post like baseball related quotes, riddles, uh, sayings, stuff that they would, you know, make up on their own that made sense that if you were in the baseball world, you understood. Yeah, right. Yeah. And they grew that. I don't know how big it was when they first launched their product, but it was big enough to where like they already pretty much had a customer base, people yeah. that related to them. And they were still posting on branded stuff like you get a lot of people nowadays. And I, there's nothing wrong with this, but like you have the mean people. They'll post a lot of memes and they're really good at it. But their end goal is to like get enough followers to kind of, you know, um, sell product or create a brand when in reality it's like that entire time you grew that following people were like really liked the content you were putting out not necessarily relating to this brand that you're trying to create whereas mm -hmm. like in the baseballism they were putting out like baseballism branded you know these sayings right and so people really connected to that brand before they even had products and now you know they've done collabs yeah. with nike they have roberto clemente as one of their licensing agreements but the okay. babe ruth family ken griffey jr mlb license you know, they're in sporting goods stores. I mean, they've grown massively. And I think that that is a, you know, a story that I like to tell because I think it's a good one that represents the importance of, I guess, you know, like you said, there's different ways to build community, but the importance of building a community because those people not only want, like, like what you're, the content you're putting out, but they want to buy what you're selling and they're proud to wear it. And I get that sense when I see your ambassadors post like it's very organic. They love the brand. They love you. And it it's, it's like enticing as someone that follows them be like, wow, that is a cool brand because they rock it so well and they're proud to rock it. And I think one mm -hmm. of the things I want to talk about is your approach with influencers or creators or, you know, what does your brand ambassador program entail? Um, what do you look at if there's someone that reaches out that says, hey, let's exchange product for content? or, you know, whatever, you know, maybe that's not what you're about. Maybe you really are just focused on, you know, organic type of content, working with ambassadors who represent your brand. Um, we just love to hear your thoughts on kind of that space. Yeah. Um, originally I, I wanted to get, um, you know, a good mix of ambassadors that would reflect, you know, different culture, um, different ethnicities, different backgrounds. Um, I have Chad, white guy most of the other guys are like either mexican um one's half black half mexican and then billy bogey just recently like we we uh, billy bogey's pretty well known amongst like folks like us seattle guy right yeah yeah so he sure. he recently agreed to like um he, also be an ambassador out in seattle and so that was that was exciting right because we we just jived on a lot of things together. So he was like, yeah, man, this makes sense to me. And um, so the idea was to get a good mixture, but at the same time, for me, it's, it's just getting a sense of people. Like it, it's in the name, right? It, it, when a gente is good people, I want to, I want to 
interact, I want to be associated with good people. And, and each one of them, if you were to reach out to any of those ambassadors, A31, golf, nice ball, golf, um, Nufo golfs, and then Joshua Hall, he's he, like, he, he started, um, modeling my stuff and like Joshua is one of those guys and, and Luis from nice ball that they were from day one. They're like, bro, I like your stuff, whatever you need. And, and I'm like, man, dude, these guys, they're not in it for, for any personal like game. They really like what I'm doing. They really want to help me out. And I'm like, man, dude, you know, I'll, I'll hook you up with the product, go out there, get some shots for me and stuff like that. And, and I'm so appreciative of all, I don't know, I think it's six of them. Right. And, um, really for me, the most important thing is just being a good person. I think one of the rules is uh, let's try to keep it clean. I want to be a positive influence on the younger crowd, on the younger kids. I want to be something that the younger crowd can look to and say, this is a positive message, a positive force and positive influence for, you know, the younger crowd in, in, in golf. Like I want to wear when I hit this stuff, which is why I recently put out the youth sizes um, <clears throat> because there's a lot of cool stuff out there. It's just not in kid sizes. Like how to, you know, that's the next generation. Those are the ones that are, dude, look at Fortnite. Fortnite's huge because of kids, you know, like if you could do a product, where they advocate for you, then you're set. Dude. You're set. So it, it, it's, it's, again, it sounds like it's a personal, like like I'm getting, I'm getting something out of it. But I I really do, I do feel like my purpose is to help out the and mentor the the younger ones, right? Like what I do in my day job, I'm a VP of product design, but I bring on and it's been years. Like I bring on a lot of junior designers straight out of boot camp, straight out of college. And I mentor them, I train them, and they become really good designers in a span of six months, honestly. Um, and I get a lot of joy doing that. And so for me, doing stuff for the youth is is like a big passion of mine now. So I tell the, I tell the ambassadors, let's try to keep things clean so that way kids that are looking at our stuff are like, yo, this is cool, man. This is cool. And, 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 you know, positive, like, how do we make being positive cool again? That's kind of hard nowadays, but it's like, cause everything's like cussing and smoking and drinking. And, um, you know, you can look through my page. I don't have that vibe, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to touch on is, you know, you mentioned that these guys that are your brand ambassadors, like they just want to help. It's nothing in it for them. Like they yeah. just love your brand. And I think that goes to show though, that when you have a brand that people can relate to, like they feel connected to based mm -hmm. on your missions, your values, your story, it, it's like they they don't need anything. They just want to help you grow because yeah. they connect to that brand. And I think that, that there's a lot of brands out there and we've talked about this where it's like, they, I mean, you know it but as well as I do. It's like they all have the same story or you go to their yeah. about me and it's all the same and it's not really that relatable, right? Yeah. And and it's like, yeah, you might find a, a polo you like from them, but it's not going to be one like, oh my God, I love this brand. I love what they represent. This is what they're all about. Like, I guarantee you, if I, you know, you were to go, you know, reach out to Nice Ball Golf and uh, ask him, you know, what do you think of Buena Gente? He won't just say, yeah, cool product. He'll be like, yeah, this is what they represent. I, you know, John's such a good guy. Like, that is the value of having a really targeted demographic with apparel that, I think appeals to everyone. Yeah. Um, but another thing you mentioned was, you know, the kids, right? The kids are huge influencers on parents' decisions. And that's something I try to preach at my, at my business or the company that I work for, you know, we're really focused on the demographic that's buying now, right? You know, yeah. the one that is uh, maximizing our bottom line, who's buying our, our vehicles. But I'm always like, well, times are changing and the next generation of buyers is coming, right? Like the oldest millennial now is like in their forties, right? Yeah. And millennials are buying cars and then Gen Z is coming. And it's like, we have to do a better job of appealing to them, capturing them early and then reducing our, you know, what is it? Lifetime acquisition value or cost mm -hmm. for customers or customer acquisition value. Um, when we actually want to sell cars and they're in the, in the market because they'll like our cars initially. And there was one idea I think, there 
I don't know if it ever happened, but it was like idea that I had was, you know, going to Roblox when Roblox was hot, it was like the, the pandemic when, you yeah. know, the virtual worlds was like the new thing, you know, and, and there were a couple brands, you know, Nike did it, Gucci did it, Chipotle did it, Hyundai did it. And I'm like, you get these people playing these games and using your cars and getting familiar with it. They're going to love your brand. They're going to tell their parents about it who could then buy. And what I just found unique about your thing about the Fortnite was like, look how big Fortnite is. And that's all because of kids. It's like, as brands, you know, obviously it's a lot of money to get into, you know, have Nike apparel in Fortnite or Buena Gente apparel in Fortnite. It's going to cost you a ton of money. I'm sure for the partnership with, with them. Um, But it's like, how do you, because kids like for apparel, right? Like kids aren't necessarily video games are different. They're on it all the time. They talk about it. It's what they do. But like Mm -hmm. apparel, golf brand, how do you get kids to, you know, influence golf? It's hard, right? You you almost have to get in, like go in Roblox, get your polo in Roblox so they can dress up in the Buena Gente polo or Fortnite, right? It's like finding unique ways to. Yeah, sorry for cutting you off. Also, before I forget, because I forget a lot of, like, I have an idea in it, and I forget immediately. But before I forget, like, the yellow hats, um, I got the first batch that it was, they were good. They just weren't the material I wanted. So my kid, my eight, at the time he was eight, he he gave one of his friends. And then... um another one of his i i met um the dad of one of his other friends and i you know we became friends gave him one and one time i went to pick up my son at a at a play date and all the kids were like can i get a hat that's sick they were saying that's so sick and it was cool right and so now with the youth sweaters he wanted to gift some of them to his best friends they're like four of them and again it's like it's almost like what that was it's not my intention at all to do it this way but some of these things just organically happen where now the kids are starting to see the 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 grip in elementary school right there's a few kids wearing it and um and that group of kids they're i would say how would you say like kind of popular amongst amongst the their grade because they all play soccer together they all hang out together and so when when the other kids start seeing, wait, two, three, four kids have these sweaters, three kids have this hat on, you know, this yellow hat, which is like you could spot from a mile away. I think those things like organically happen. And, you know, my kids are being vehicles to that. My older son, uh, he's 13. He was on the football team. And after practice one day, one of the kids was like, dude, your logo is so sick. I've been seeing Enzo wear your stuff since last year, since elementary school. Now they're in middle school. And so, you know, like little by little, kind of like, you know, influencing, I think that works, right? Where you can influence through school, through like after school programs. Um, But it's, again, like many other things that I do, it it wasn't planned out that way. But I'm starting to see it gain traction like that amongst the the kids through my kids' school, you know? Yeah. And they're through their friends. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I was just thinking, you know, thinking out loud here, but it's like, I think kids are a huge gateway, right? Uh, Not only for future customers, but, you know, if they're talking about it, they're going to post, it's just natural, right? They're going to do their social media thing and it goes all over and really organic. Um, I was thinking like one thing you could do is if you had the money, you could, you know, you don't have to go to the highest quality, but you make, you know, 500 Buena Gente hats and you send 20 to every every first tee, you know, across the first tee organization across the country, they give them out to their players. And now, you know, 20 kids at first tees across the country are wearing your hat and they're posting about it because they're, yeah. you know, future golfers. And they, you know, a lot of these young kids now have their own social media accounts and some of them are big, some of them are small, but like, you know, their friends are following them and they want to wear what they're wearing. And it's like, you're right. Like kids are a huge influencer um huge dude and and this is way before the pandemic like i've worked in id tech camps it was a summer camp for tech camp for kids and fortnite was huge then that was i don't know seven years ago so um and so you know uh, what 18 no sorry 
13 years ago, I was working on like this virtual world for kids. Um, and Club Penguin was huge at the time. I don't know if you remember or ever, ever heard of that, but this where a bunch of little kids get, you know, they set up an account and they're little penguins on a nice, on a, like a nice bird type of thing, just walking around, interacting with each other. So it's like, you know, again, not, not my, not my intention. This wasn't my primary goal, but kids are huge. You know, they're, they're huge brand advocators. If you get in good with them, they can they can make your your brand take off you know so it, it's um, it, how you build loyalty i think it's hard yeah. to build loyalty with older buyers because especially ones that maybe you know aren't necessarily loyal to a brand but they're buying all these not, all the, these different brands but a kid you know you start them early they love something and then re, re, for the rest of their life like that's what they like and what they want and what yeah that's hard about. though yeah cuz kids kids quickly think something's corny after, after like, I can't believe I like that. You know, <laughs> like after some years, they're like, okay, that was for kids. I'm, I'm older now. You know, as soon as they get into middle school, it's like, all right, I wear adult stuff. And so that is hard, but it'd be, it'd be, but it'd be great to crack that. You have but, that transition, right. Of yeah, like yeah. your apparel, you have the kids line and then you have the adult line. Yeah. Yeah. I think I could, so, I think, Many people can do it. I think many people can do it. I, I think right now I'm at that place right that I, I again, not for any personal um, gain. Um, I'd I'd love to do it so that kids feel like, oh, dude, I represent something. I feel cool and and, and stuff like on, on the golf course wearing the 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 grip graphic on on their chest. But I think there's a lot a lot of opportunity there for sure. Yeah. And like yeah, I said so, in the post, you know, like there's a lot of, you know, I was going to sarcastically say if I if I put these sweaters at seven hundred dollars, will people start paying attention? Right. Because there's a lot of brands out there, really, really cool brands, super like expensive, but they're the ones that get all the attention. Right. They get it. Right. So it's like, how do we make this thing for kids really cool and get the attention of Golf Digest and all these other brands? They don't, they're not paying attention to that. They're not seeing that, you know, kids also do deserve to, to feel and look cool. And I was going to sarcastically say like, should I price this at like $700 again to get people's attention? But, um, but yeah, that the, the, the idea is to, you know, as soon as my kid saw it, he was like, his eyes like lit up, you know? He, he feels like now he's wearing something that they, because everybody aspires to be older uh, up until you get to my age. <laughs> you as, uh, kids <laughs> aspire to be older than what they are, right? Um, Eight-year-olds eight want to do what 10-year-olds do. 10-year-olds want to do what 12-year-olds or 13-year-olds or the teenagers do. So I, um, I thought it was cool to see his reaction when he saw the, the yeah. youth swap. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Um definitely understand you know wanting to be like you know your dad too right uh when i was younger i always would take stuff from my dad i wanted to look just like him and be just like him yeah. um i don't want to jump ship here and talk about something else yeah. um more about um the difficulty of running a golf brand um or starting one uh while working full-time because I, I think a lot of people you know are like you right if it, the smaller golf brands this isn't their full-time thing, but it is their aspiration to make it their full-time thing. Yeah. So what are, you know, the sacrifices or the difficulties, the challenges of running a golf brand, you know, pretty much by yourself while working full-time and being a parent and a husband. Um, I think this is important for people to hear. Yeah. I, I, I wish I could say I got it figured out. I don't have it figured out. I'm, I'm, I manage a team of designers. I have about five designers in India. I have a designer that just moved to London. She was in Chicago and she just moved to London. Um, so I'm dealing with a few different time zones and that is early in the morning. And then I get to work on my stuff once everybody logs off from like 11 a.m. on. Um, Kids get out of school and that is a, a non-negotiable for me, right? Like when they're here, um, I spend time with them. We go out to dinner a lot. We, I cook here with my wife. So family is very important for me. 
Um, <clears throat> that being said, yeah. if uh -huh. I just want to hop in there real quick, the family yeah. is important um, thing. I have a couple, some of my best friends that I played college baseball with um, are Latin, right? Yeah. And one thing I've realized to them is family is super important. So yeah. is that, you know, do you think that, I, I think, you know, a lot of cultures, family is important, but specifically in the Latin culture, is family one of the most important things that like you grow sure. up, you know, learning about and kind of embracing? 100%. 100%. It's, it's part of the, the, uh, our DNA and, um, I think family is what, um, they instill those, those good manners, the morals and stuff like that to the kids and, and, you know, spending time with them. Not all families are the same, you know, not, not like my wife, when we first got married, she was like, you talk to your family every day, <laughs> but <Like>, I talk <laughs> to them every single day. Right. It's not the same anymore, but you know, all families are different, but in general, yes, family is a really, really important thing for the, the, the Latin community or Hispanics overall. Um, but yeah, so that being said, when I can work on things is at night and, and you know how that is nighttime rolls around. Sometimes you got the energy, sometimes you don't. And there are things I have here back there in the whiteboard that I have ideas for months and months. <clears throat> and um, it just becomes a bit difficult to get them out. You know, days turn into weeks and then months. And, and people are like, dude, when are you going to restock this? Why don't you come out with this other thing? And I'm like, I have all these ideas. It becomes difficult. And that's why I said in the beginning of, of, um, of me trying to, to answer this question is I don't have it figured out, honestly. Um, I know that at some point this this will become my full time job. I will have people that will help me um, with with uh, all the other things that I'm doing. But when you're a, when when you own a company, you're I remember hearing a while back somebody saying you're everything. You're the janitor. You're you're the customer service. You're everything. Right. Um, and juggling all those things and my full time job and my family. Um, it's it's not easy, dude. I mean, even even just time for yourself becomes difficult, it becomes really, really hard. Yeah. So I think what I got from that is that, you know, to start a golf brand or really, I mean, any brand right mm -hmm. out there, any industry working full time is there's going to be sacrifices. And if you want it, you have to figure out ways to make it happen. Sure. Um, you and know, you know and, and it's funny. You want to do it, too. You got to do it because you want to do it. Not because there's, you know, because people do it because there's money in it. But it's like okay, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Like I'm doing this because, okay, shoot. I see there's an opportunity, but I, I started when I had to brand cause I wanted to do something I love, which is designing. I don't get to design much now. So it's a way for me to keep my skills sharp for me to do something that represented me. And then it turned into golf, but it, it, you know, if you're doing it because you absolutely love it, sacrifice. So don't get me wrong. There are days that I'm here till four in the morning. So sacrifice is not really a word for you when you're doing something you love, right? No, but it's, it gets to a point that somebody tells you, go to sleep, dude, or stop what you're doing. Take a break. My wife will be like, it's okay to take a break. Right. <laughs> and, and that's why the work hard, you know, like I'll see in TikTok, like, what do you do for business? They're like, what, what, what suggestions do you have for somebody starting now? Work hard. Like, yeah. Any, anybody and everybody should work hard, right? But it's, you don't have to tell somebody that's doing something that they love to work hard or to sacrifice. Cause it's just like hours and hours go by without you even noticing. Right. So with all that being said, there are days I'm here till four, five in the morning, three in the morning, working on when I hit this stuff, you know, um, and then go to sleep for a few hours, wake up. Sometimes there's meetings at six 30 in the morning. It's, people, you know, evening in India, but I have to catch those meetings at 6.30 in the morning or seven. So yes, there is sacrifice when you pull back, right? And look at the, the big pictures, like I never stop. It's, it's almost like I don't have a stop button or a pause button. But, but when you're, you know, living day to day, all these things is, you're, you're doing what you love, you know? So you yeah. blur that line of work and, and, and play. You, once you blur that line, you're, you're set, man.
Yeah, you mentioned, you know, that part of why you wanted to do this was to kind of design again. And it's funny because my first role at General Motors was brand marketing. And that's what I love to do. I love marketing, right? But I'm one of those people that I forget who told me this, but they're like, you can be an inch wide and a mile deep, or you can be a mile wide and an inch deep, you know, and in other words, basically means you can be really good at one thing, or you can know a little about a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, early in my career, I'd rather do things that maybe I don't love, but I can gain more skills doing. And so I've been away from marketing for a couple of years now, and I, I miss it. I really enjoy marketing, specifically social media marketing. And I was like, man, you know, I like creating videos. I, I made like 200 YouTube shorts before I ever started, you know, this okay. golf page. And the, and the YouTube shorts were basically just like sports. Some of it was like started with investing. And I'm like, you know, there's so many people out there and I'm not the best investor. And I don't enjoy really, like, I don't love talking about it. I was like, I love sports. I'll start making YouTube shorts and try to, you know, get a thousand subscribers and monetize that platform. And then I was like, okay, I love golf. I miss marketing. Let's create a page where I can create content that I enjoy, yeah. love to make. And, and it, it's fun for me where it's like, it's almost an escape from my nine to five, right? Where yeah. I'm not doing marketing, but this is something that is marketing. And I can, you know, own it on my skills to be yeah. a better marketer, or understand how social media works better. Or, you know, when I back into marketing, understand how, where we're going wrong with social media, or what we should be doing, or how to manage it, or how to work with influencers. And I really enjoy it. And I have friends that are like, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, I just love it. Like, yeah. I love making content about something I'm passionate about. It's fun for me. Um, yeah. I didn't do it with the intention, you know, to make certain amount, you know, make money or whatever. Like, I genuinely enjoy putting out content, seeing people engage, um, you do well. meeting new people. Well. And it's, yeah. it's just really, really fun. And so I kind of relate to what you were saying there. Um, yeah. but you're right. Like if you love to do it, it's not necessarily a sacrifice because you know, you enjoy it, right? A, a sacrifice is doing something that, I mean, I guess some people would still consider it a sacrifice, sure, um, sure. but you know, it, I think it's easier when you have built something that you feel so connected with, right? Like it's really easy to come up with an idea and like, Oh, this is a good idea. It can make me money. But like, I don't give a shit about this yeah. idea or product or business, like I could not see myself spending all my free time trying to build this. Like I just couldn't. Yeah. Right. And so I think when you find that thing that you're really passionate about, you really connect to, it's really easy to say, you know, when you clock off family time and it's like, I got to get back to work. I got to grind this out. Um, and I just think that that's important for people to realize. Um, I think a lot of people, like you said, they see money in it. They put a logo on a polo and, source some polo from some manufacturer they've you know only spoken to once they didn't try any others and they think yep now i'm going to make money but it's really not that simple and, yeah. and not that easy and probably the wrong approach to do it right like i think it's so much important to figure out what your brand means what it represents the the logos the designs before you ever really start pushing stuff yeah. out there because all that stuff matters um <laughs> I guess, you know, you mentioned that some people are just like work hard, you know, obviously, right. Yeah. But what are some of the best lessons you've learned from starting a golf brand and building one? Um, great question. There's it, just because there's lessons every day. Um, yeah. And I, you can even focus on, and I think, cause I think this is a huge aspect of, of it, right? Like day-to-day -day operations is one thing, but the, the sourcing, like let's talk, let's focus on sourcing, like lessons learned from sourcing. You know, how many suppliers did you meet with? How many suppliers have you tried? What was that process? Because I've, I've tried using Alibaba and I've tried communicating with all these suppliers and it's like, how do you pick one? You know, you got to go through a lot of uh, samples. And so just want to hear it from you, from someone that's done it and still doing it. Yeah. Um, so I was talking to um, my buddy. I told you about him yesterday. Uh, we we went to college together, we graduated with graphic design uh, degree together, and he went on to do really big things for Nike. Most recently, Nike. Now he's in Free Fly, but Nike, um, Adidas, Fox Racing, and Under Armour. And he told he was he was building out the strategy for me, and he's like, "All right, this is gonna take six to nine months." And I was like, "Yo." I'm not waiting that long. I was like, I got something hot here in my hands. 
people are, are responding to it. And although what he was laying out for me, I still need to do. I want, I, we are going to do that. Um, what I wanted to get is something out there quickly. And he was like, why don't you go to Alibaba? And I was like, all right, I'll check it out. And um, to be honest with you, I go through manufacturers um, just recently with the, with the t-shirts, you know, there are things where communication could be an issue. Um, just interacting with each other back and forth. I've had long, long messages with people in Alibaba where I'm just asking, what do you mean by this? <laughs> and they're explaining, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't really get that. Do you mean this? You know, so communication is one thing. Um, the quality of stuff that you get, it doesn't match, you know, um, through Alibaba with a lot of manufacturers. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, most of the times it doesn't. And you have to be as descriptive as possible when you're ordering a sample. Everything, everything. And I learned the hard way. It's like if you leave something out, you're giving them space to do whatever they want there. So if you leave out the color of the seam or the stitching, right, if you leave that out, you'll get it purple or something like that. It's like really weird. You have to be as descriptive and as specific as possible with everything. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, I'm still looking, you know, with, with the, with the cream flan, flan sweaters, those sold out. The person that first did those for me, I couldn't get a reply back, a text back from him. So I was like, all right, can I at least get the size chart? Nothing. I had to go everything from scratch. And I think I did a, a, a story once where I was just showing all the different samples I got, sweater after sweater after sweater after sweater. And um, I have a guy that's uh, wanting to help me distribute in Japan. He's like, bro, your stuff is going to blow up in Japan. And this is from the last PGA show. So basically, it's been 12 months that I have him on hold because I can't find the right manufacturer to to send to him, you know, send him a large order to Japan, right? And for him to start distributing over there. Um, so it becomes really hard. Money is a big issue, right? It's a big factor in all of this. Alibaba allows you to do minimum order quantity of 10, 25, 50, right? But that that also, you know, you get what you pay for. So um so yeah, I, I the things that I do sell, it's because I'm like, okay, I like this, but I have boxes of stuff that I paid for. And through Alibaba, try to get your money back. You know, just try to try to negotiate something through impossible. I have thousands of dollars of stuff. The gloves that I've been like post just not to the quality of I, that's why I haven't sold them yet. And that's probably the number one thing that people are like, bro, the gloves, those gloves are sick. And I'm like, we're, we're still working on that. I, I found that another manufacturer will work, but I have boxes of stuff where I just don't like the quality of it. And I finally well, got a manufacturer where it's, it's better. And that's when I can release things. And that's why you see big gaps of my releases. It's yeah. just like a lot of force. Yeah. Yeah. And I, when I was working for baseballs, um, I remember hearing like, yeah, Dick Sporting Goods wants us in their stores. I'm like, well, why aren't you doing it? Like, what? Just do it. Like, he's yeah. like, I, I remember, I don't think this was the exact quote, but it was something like growing fast isn't always the best thing to do or like growing yeah. too, too big, too quickly. And I'm like, well, why? He's like, well, we have to worry about distribution. We have to worry about our, yeah. our, uh, our sourcing, how much quantity we get lead times because of, you know, they're selling in their stores. They have their, uh, direct to consumer commerce site and now mm. now they're at MLB licensing they are in bigger stores now but it becomes such a, a bigger challenge when you it, a lot more things are unpredictable right when yeah. you start growing and now you're in big box retail stores dick sporting goods shields all over the country you need to have the people in in the warehouse making sure that you can get orders out you got to have the people managing the lead times and reordering yeah. products, what products you need to order, what t-shirts you should, you know, cut, which t-shirts you should keep selling, uh, whether you want a different color of the same design that sold well, what color should that be? 
Yeah. I mean, I remember baseball as in, they had boxes of stuff too that like was mm-hmm. either defect product or product that, you know, they didn't end up selling. And it's crazy how often that it actually happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that that is a huge part of building a, a brand. You know, you got to do the stuff on the front end, which is like building the brand, having the logo, having the mission, having the story, having an idea of exactly what you want to do. But then it's a whole different ball game when you're talking about the sourcing of the actual product, the quality, the colors, the specs, the fitting, all that stuff. Um, and I, what made me think of that is your Japan distribution, where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, it sounds great, but it's such, you know, and it would be a no brainer, but it's yeah. a big challenge, right? It's like, you got to make sure you have the suppliers that can give you the amount you need in the time that you need it. You don't want to order too much. You don't want to order too little. You need to know when you need to order again. If it's, you know, if it flies off shelves within a week and now people have to wait two months to get yeah. it again, like that's not a good experience. And so it, it is such a challenge. And that's why I am mm-hmm. not in the, I, you know, I would love to start a brand, but I would never do it because yeah. I don't want to deal with all that stuff. And so I really admire those that go through that. And, you know, like you said, you're still trying to figure things out, but somewhat, you know, quote unquote, master it right to a degree as good as you can right yeah, um, yeah exactly to, to, like not that i'm trying to figure things out in the sense where i'm like oh i'm putting out crap <laughs> like there's uh, my attention to detail is almost it's a double edged sword you know it it holds me back from doing a lot of things right there's times that i mean i i've had to go to therapy for it i've i've had um coworkers tell me john move on like let's let's move on to the next project cuz i'm i'm so and I take pride in the fact that that's what I do with the stuff I put out also. Um, but it, it's it's a lot of work, right? I, I say I don't have it figured out in the sense of how do I, you know, I'm working out the kinks right now. That's that's what I mean by I don't have it figured out. But what I put out, I'm, I'm very proud of it. And um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I wish I had all the answers for that. Um, but when you again, sometimes it, it it doesn't matter what you put out. Like I put out a t-shirt and it, it sells out and you're like, what a t-shirt. Right. But to your point earlier, it's, it's the logo. It's what it represents. It's what, what, it, what it represents. It's the name of the company. It's like a lot of things. There's so many things people can kind of like jive with that. They're like, all right, I'm going to get this because of, you know, this reflects my personality. It's not like a, you know, a t-shirt or a sweater is, is, you know, some novelty, like it's so different, you know? So um, I think that's the thing that, that has people coming back, you know, have a lot of repeat buyers. And I think that's what has people buying, you know, the, the merch to begin with. There's, it's all in the brand. It's all in the, in the mission and in the vision that, that I have. And, you know, I think I'm I'm pretty successful with that, even with the captions and stuff, because one person told me, dude, I feel like I, I feel like I'm in like in the in the Caribbeans when I see your stuff or um, this one guy got a, the spread collar green shirt. He's like, bro, I feel like all I need is a fedora and a cigar. And I was like, dude, I know I, I was successful when somebody tells me that. Right. It's like if you can make somebody feel something that's. Like, that's what I'm in the business of. of like, I, I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm a storyteller through the captions, through the photos, through whatever I'm doing. I try to convey, you know, a message. I try to put you in a place and a time. And if I could do that, um, then I'm, I've been successful. So, yeah, finding manufacturers is one part of it, right? It could be through Alibaba. It could be through anywhere. But you know, the, the really important thing is how does the person on the other end feel about this? You know, how do you draw them to your product and how do they feel when they actually get it? All right. So that for me is all it, it, it's called, uh, it's called, um, customer experience. Customer experience is not just the user experience, but it's from the very first touch point. The very first touch point is when somebody sees your brand, when they interact with you through, uh, direct messages, People have told me, dude, you're respond, you're quick, you respond quick. Uh, a class, A plus customer service. I've been told through one of the girls that was buying something for her husband um, because she's like, I can't pay through Macau. I was like, I'll figure out a way for you to pay. 
you know, I'll send you a link to pay with whatever. Like I'll always figure out a way for people to get the product in their hands because I know that that's what they're looking for. I'll try to deliver it one way or another. And so they could, you know, and opening up the package, seeing the letter, the welcome letter to welcome to the Buena Gente fam, all that is an experience, all of it. Yeah. And so yeah. the manufacturer is one slice of it, right? It's only one slice of the story. Yeah, uh, I have a couple things, but quickly I'll, I'll say, you know, you, I got a package from you and that experience is, you know, high quality. There's a lot of brands out there. And I, and I would say some of the best brands that do a good unboxing experience are actually the smaller ones. Um, I was watching a Landforce video where he, was it Peter Millar sent him a package and it was like a white package <laughs> with a packing slip and that was it, right? Yeah. Um, I think what happens, and this is what I told him, well, this is my opinion, is that when brands get too big, they look at ways they can cut costs, you yeah. know, and an easy way to cut costs is not having branded packaging, not having branded tape, not having inserts, just sending the just sending the product in a blank package with a packing slip. That's it. Because I think they feel that they've already established themselves as a known brand and they don't have to create that customer experience anymore because people yeah. already know like they're they're gonna buy their product anyways. Where I'm a big believer is like always maintain that customer experience, that branded packaging, the branded tape, um, the inserts that tell people about your brand. Like I think that that adds a lot of value. Um and yeah. I think some of the people that do it best are actually the small brands. I'm sure some big brands do. Yeah. Um, but when I saw his video of unboxing a Peter Millar, I was like, man, you're paying 350 you know, plus dollars for two things. Like I would expect them to spend a little bit of money and give you just this great unboxing experience. Yeah. But the, you know, like you said, a customer experience starts from the first touch point and really doesn't end, right? Yeah. Like, customer experience is important, returns are important, that unboxing experience is important, how it makes someone feel when they wear it, what they, you know, anytime they interact with your brand is part of that customer experience. And the brands that put the customer first in the center of everything they do, in my opinion, are the brands that have the best chance at being successful. And I do think it gets a little more challenging when you're big because you become more unrelatable Right. Yeah. You have someone managing your social media. That's not you. Right. And it's not as personal. Um, and I always think that that is some one of the biggest challenges is when when you grow um, of, of like maintaining that. Um, but one of the, the two things I wanted to say about the the sourcing um, was, you know, it helps having money. And I know we've talked about yeah. money makes a big difference. But like when you're looking at sourcing a, a certain product, like the easy way to do it is finding five distributors or, or sorry, five suppliers that make whatever you're looking to make and get samples from all of them, but samples cost money. Right. And that would be, you know, the best solution would be get samples from as many as you can get till you find the right one, but that costs you money. And then you got to put in an order and it might not be exactly what you were looking for from what yeah. they sent. Um, so, you know, obviously having money is a, a huge competitive advantage in that process. And then connections. If you've already been in the industry, it's really easy to find the supplier that you know works well and works efficient and effectively. But also, yeah. when I was at Baseballs, and I know I brought it up a few times, uh, was you know they have some overseas suppliers, and they would go every year, go see them. I you yeah. know whether it was just like looking at the factory, looking at the quality, but I think mostly it has to do with like building that relationship. Your supplier yeah. isn't just a third party you use. Like if you're looking to build a sustainable brand, you want to build a strong relationship with them and have that relationship where they will bend over backwards to get you know, get get you what you need because they're as important part of your brand as anyone. Right. Yeah. Like you can't sell anything if you don't have product. Um yeah, yeah. they make a mistake, you want to have a relationship with that like, hey we own this, like we'll we'll, we'll make it right because we yeah. value your business. So obviously having money helps with sourcing, but I also think an important part about it is building that relationship with, For sure, with yeah. your suppliers. Um, yeah. There's some buddies of mine in, in Puerto Rico um, and they are the ones in charge of, of penguin in Puerto Rico. So all the distribution to Pen uh, to Puerto Rico for penguin polos. And so they work with manufacturers in, in El Salvador and Colombia. And they were telling me, dude, let's move you over there. Cause it's a quick flight over there. It's not the same as going to, 
you know, like Vietnam or China or something like, you know, it's not the same. He's like, we were like, hey, something's wrong here. Get on a flight, go to Columbia quick, you know? Something's not right here, get on a flight, go. So um, that's, that. I'm I'm in the process of all that, like moving my stuff to, to one of these manufacturers. But yes, you're right. You're 100% right. The relationships you build with these people is so important. Even, even, even communicating that you don't like something, right? They're there to work with you. Um, it's uh, it's very important communication and, and relationship building with them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure when I was there at Baseballsum, they changed suppliers to someone in Columbia. I don't know where mm-hmm. there was initially, um, but same kind of idea as you right yeah. it was like it makes more sense for them to be somewhere closer where they can hop on a flight yeah. if there's issues and you know go deal with it a couple more things before we we wrap up here but one of the things i wanted to hear hear from you was what brands do you admire most and take inspiration from i like um i don't know if i'm saying this right mccain Maced. i've heard both ways on youtube or you know some reviewers say it like that um I like their designs, right? So, you know, the stuff they do has has this really nice, um, almost like formal, casual, casual look to it. Um, you could go out, play, and then go to a restaurant, still look really nice in their stuff. I, I like their stuff. I draw a lot of inspiration from what they do. Um, Let's see. I like this. I haven't gotten anything from them. Uh, this is brand called Local Local Golf. I saw them a long time ago. Um, again, another another brand, same as McCade or M- like they don't get as much attention as I feel like they should. Um, everybody raves about these other lifestyle brands, but. Um, I think McCade, I think uh, local golf is a really cool one. And um, shoot, not many other ones that I draw inspiration from. Um, I don't mean it in in a bad way. I just, I love to do and create things that um, is, is, is not like run in the mill or just common. So I feel like a lot of stuff that comes out is just common stuff and there's nothing really to it. There's nothing special about it. And so all these brands, I don't care how much coverage they get. It's a polo with a logo on it. It's like, there's nothing to money. It, right? Talk, right? Yeah, money so talk. It's like, there's a story behind the Guayabera. You may like it, you may not like it, but there's a story behind the pattern, right? There's a story behind like the, the spread color. It's not a Guayabera, but it, there's a feel that people get. They're like, shoot, I feel like I'm in Cuba or something, right? So there's, I always try to do something with purpose. I always try to do something different. And again, not to hate on anybody because I, I admire a lot of them, but I don't draw inspiration from a lot of people. I honestly don't. Um, I, well, I feel like, like for example, the the baseball jersey, I see a, I see a lot of people do that. Not to say I was the first one, but I hadn't seen it before, right? So for me, I was like, why not create a baseball jersey, you know, a golf jersey, but it's like it's baseball inspired. All right. And I like to do this juxtaposition of or like clashing worlds. I love to do that, right? Um, same thing with, with this. It's it's a it's a ring, but it's like how much how much jewelry is out there for for like golf jewelry or or um, something golfers could use that when they're not playing, you know, that almost like represents their interests, their likes, who they are. So I don't draw inspiration from a lot of people, to be quite honest. I just draw inspiration well, from life, you know? Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, this is uh, one brand that I like really admire based like for a lot of reasons, right, is Malbon. But mm-hmm. sometimes I get really confused on some of their drops of mm-hmm. like why people are so hyped about it. You know, uh, not necessarily the ones where it's like unique collabs with like 100 Thieves or Pendleton or Seamus, right? Not those ones, but it's like, it's like the ones where they just co- like put their logo on an Adidas polo or a Nike polo, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, 
why are people so hyped about that? And it also doesn't necessarily make sense to me, like for their brand identity to just, you know, I think for them, it's more of a strategy of like, if we're everywhere, like people will see us. We're, on, we're yeah. like every single thing we like can appeal to someone, you know, maybe yeah. like our Western collection, I don't know if that's what it's called, isn't going to appeal to someone, but our Nike polo or Adidas polo will. But yeah. I'm always, you know, I just get a little, they, they drop so many things so often. And a lot of what they drop is awesome. But other stuff, I'm just like, didn't I admire take- it. I admire what they're doing. Um, I admire like, how, I was talking to a buddy of mine. Sorry for cutting you off. But the, no, a, no, a buddy of mine in Mexico, he actually does their head covers. He he, he works for, he does the, the leather goods for Jones, Malbon and all of them. He, he spoke with Malbon. He was like, dude. It's impressive how the brand loyalty, it's, I guess, an event that they had in, in Mexico. I forget exactly where it was. He's like, oh, I rolled up in my Grayson and like my, my company had and, and some Adidas shorts. He's like, everybody is in Malibu. Like everybody head to toe. And he's like, it's impressive, man. And I, it, I admire that. It's very impressive. I don't know if, if there's a... Um, I don't know if I draw inspiration. I do like their stuff. I draw inspiration from some of the things, but like to say from one product, like, uh, like I, I need to do it this way. Not, not really. I don't see anybody really like the collaborations. I like what Malbon's doing with collaborations. Cause it's that right. It's clashing worlds. Right. It's like Coca Cola, Cola and Malbon. I, that's an example. I don't particularly understand that, but it's two separate worlds. Right. Well, what it's I like it's like is behind like Seven Eleven. Like, what skin do they like? Everybody went nuts over it, and I'm like, so you won't go in the middle of the night to <laughs> look at that. Uh, <laughs> so you won't go in the middle of the night to to get some for Seven Eleven, but you'll buy their golf stuff. Like, what's the purpose? What's the story behind it? Like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, so. I'll say that, like, I think, you know, a, a smart strategy about Melbourne, it's kind of like, I guess, was my approach at the beginning of like, if I can create content for brands and I collaborate with them, I'm going to be put on their pages and I might be able to attract some of their followers, right? If I'm like, ev- if I'm like everywhere, right? As like, I can, I, as like, it was a, a strategy where I feel like some, like, sometimes that's Malbon's approach, where it's like bringing Coca Cola and putting on golf stuff, like, I don't know why. But it's like Coca Cola is a worldwide known brand. Yeah. It's everywhere, and it's like if now you're on Coca Cola social media, you know now you're growing. You're finding yeah, other yeah. areas to grow by collabing with with products or brands that aren't necessarily aligned with your followers, and they're gonna be like, "Oh, wow, this brand's really cool." And I do think you know, Malbon has done a really good job, especially with getting people into their stuff, yeah. whether it's, you know, free product or, you know, pain influence. I don't know their strategy, but they get a lot of high, uh, you know, important individuals rep in Malbon and they proudly do it. And I think when you said at the Mexican, or sorry, Mexican, the Mexico event they had, yeah. everyone's wearing it because they're just, they love it. And they, I think the unique they thing about them. Malbon is they're big, but they've still found a way to really create a strong community of people. And that's Same hard thing. to do when you get yeah. to a certain size, right? When they host these events, like not all brands host these types of events, but like, I also think Malbon has this, this token club. I don't know what it's called, but it's like, it was like an NFT oh. or you bought one of their NFTs. You're part of this yeah. buckets club. I think it's buckets yeah. club. Is that what it is? Like that was smart of them, right? It's like they yeah. get exclusive yeah. access to events. They made money off of it. Um, and you feel a part of this community. Um, Malbon's one of those, uh, business cases that like, it will be interesting to go back on, you know, 10, 15 years from now to see where they're at and see like, you know, what really, what caused this, this growth there, they, they've really, I think, in my opinion, changed the golf industry, the apparel side of it and what people expect apparel to look like, um, really brought in lifestyle streetwear into golf. Um, yeah. and I think, you know, Steven is obviously a, a genius for what he's done. And uh, I do admire it. But sometimes man. I'm like, damn, every other week, every week they're putting out a new yeah. collab. And, and I'm like, I, I'm just thinking about my company. I'm like, how long it takes to create a partnership, like go through the contracts and come to an agreement on what works best and the marketing. And it's I like, 
I heard how, that they're years ahead. Work? They have like collaborations till 2025. That's from what I heard. Like they're way ahead. Like <laughs> and so that goes to like the planning, right? Of yeah. like when you get to a certain size, like you have no choice but to plan. You can't just yeah. be bootstrapping in at that that point anymore. And and you know that's a, a smart approach. Hey, you muted yourself. Oh, okay. Yeah, my bad. I always comment on their stuff, and I'm like, the devil works hard, but Malbon works harder, mm-hmm. right? Like. The, no. I couldn't imagine being on that partnership or collaboration team, whatever they want to call it. They're probably working nonstop trying to find the yeah. next collab, that next collab. And, you know, I think the smart approach is doing it how they have, where they have it planned so far out mm-hmm. where it's like the people who are working on the partnerships, they don't feel rushed. I think one mm-hmm. of the, the toughest thing uh, about, you know, business in general is launch product launch. Right. And if they have it so planned far in advance, it's easier to execute. you know seamlessly than doing something uh that's not you know it's like oh we got to push it back a month we got to push this back a month where it's like seems like they're so far ahead they don't run into those issues because the issues that they run into are like four months before launch and then they're ready to go yeah i would love to see the numbers but i think malbon uh, is a great brand but sometimes you know like we said it it's like what how you know what is the value they see of putting on adidas polo um but in my opinion, it's like they're just attracting more people. And, you know, maybe they have it down where they know how many products that they need to have to sell. And they're selling the, the you know, the right amount before they move on to the next product. Like, I, I don't know. I, I would love to, you know, be a fly on the wall in some of those meetings, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, they, they, they nailed the brand loyalty thing, man. They, they really, they really did. And that's not to take away from their stuff. Their stuff looks dope. Like. It a lot is, of their stuff is awesome, so, it, right? It, it's so cool. Um, so I, I admire everything they're doing, seriously. But um, yeah. but yeah. yeah, going back to the original thing, I I I, I look at other, I look at a, I get inspiration a little bit from everywhere, but it's not like one brand that I'm like, wow, I want to model it after this. I really don't have that. I you know I'd like to be. <laughs> I'm at a place where I don't I don't know if this is um if Buena Gente becomes a you know a kid thing where people would like to do collaborations with with us or something like that that that'd be really cool but um yeah just 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 going with the motions of everything and cool. and I'm going where the audience tells me. Well, have you ever thought um about like what other Latin brands or you know are out there that you, that aren't in the golf industry that you could collab with that might appeal, you know, that already have a big Latin following that would make a cool collab because that's like what's unique to you. Right. Is like, you have a specific audience, like Malbon, they're collabing with everybody. Like (laughs) fairies. I'm like those fairy shoes. Like I would would never wear those, but people like them and people were hyped about it. And I'm like, that confused me, but Hmm. it was another collab that kind of makes them, more unique compared to everyone else. And I feel like that's what you could do and, and really grow that Latin basis. I'd love to go find the opposite Latin way. Brands out there. Yeah, I'd love, uh, you know, it's it's funny that you say that because I, I I don't know, for me, it's it's weird. I see something that's popular. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do the opposite. Um, and, and I still think that a lot of these brands are are still doing what golf is known for, which is white collar, you know, like higher tier company. Like Sperry for me, it just, it's a certain type of person, you know? And so when I see these these things, I'm like, I want to go the opposite way. I want to go, you know, with a, a Spanish seasoning company or something like that. You know, like something very raw, something that is that is like, people can relate to in in any household you find it in any household you don't have to spend 200 300 dollars for an item all right and and i'd like to do collaborations with with those type of companies you know like something something a little more i don't know relatable approachable you know yeah that makes sense so one of the last things i want to hear is from you is you know 10 years from now, where would you like to see Buena Gente golf? Um, I'd like to see it in, in pro shops in golf courses and country clubs right next to, 
um, all the other, you know, Peter Millar and Travis Matthew and Nike and Adidas. And, um, you know, I really do feel that it's, I'll get to that point. It's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, I just feel that that's, I'll be in good company there, but at the same time, I feel like I'd, I'd, uh, I'd stand out from that pack, you know, yeah. it's almost like, um, always set yourself up for, for success. Like <laughs> be in company where you're going to look like you're really going to stand out. You know, you see Peter, Peter Millar, Travis Matthew, not to take anything away from them. I mean, they're Titans, but to see a buena gente golf polo right next to them, people will be like, I'm snagging this. This, this yeah. feels like me, like this is relatable. And, and I'm not talking about just Latinos. I'm talking about white, black, Asian, Indian, anybody, right. Can, can look at this and be like, this feels like, like an approachable brand. This feels like if I put it on, I'm not a snob almost, you know? And so yeah. I want to make yeah. that popular. I want to make that feeling more, uh, more mainstream rather than just like, you know, these um hoity toity type of type of brands out right now great and the last thing is for the people that are still watching if there was <laughs> you know anything that you could say about your brand or you want people to take away about your brand what would it be um you know it's 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 for you guys it, it really is i i have you know, my margins are tiny. I, I hardly make anything. We, we spoke about the inserts and the stickers I put in all this stuff. It adds up. My margins are, are tiny. I'm not doing this because, you know, it was a, it's a, a, a personal like game that I'm going to get so much out of it. I'm doing it because I know there's a need. I want to, I want to put out apparel. I want to put a community together where people are like, Dude, yeah, this is for us. This represents me. This reflects my culture, my background. And not not only that, but even if it does even if this isn't my culture background, I can relate to this. I can relate to the people. Right? And um I I often say I want to be I want to make being a good person cool again. I I think, you know, the more um the more rebellious you look or you make yourself out to be in social media, the cooler you are really, you know, there's really no way around that. And, and I find that to be a sad thing. And I just want to make being a good person cool again. You know, I want to, you know, where conversations like this is, is what's, is, is what we represent. And to, to, you know, for whoever's still watching, um, I do that with that purpose. You know, it's, um, it's for you guys. It's so you feel like there it's, it's for a good cause. And, um, yeah, you know, uh, I, 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 I do it cause it's my passion. It's, it's not really, you know, um, there's a lot of money in this space, but it's not because of that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think that that's a great way to conclude this. Um, like I said, I wanted to keep it to 30, 40 minutes. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to do it. Uh, almost at an hour and a half. Um, okay. But I want to say, John, thank you for your time. I know we've been trying to get this done. I uh, really appreciate it. Comp mm -hmm. that, you know, episode two, we already, we already, <laughs> you know, getting Buena Gente out there. Um, I appreciate, appreciate you know, your insight, your experience, and I hope others that listen, you know, learn from it and get inspiration from it. Um, and even, you know, maybe become new customers or fans of Buena Gente. So with that said, that concludes episode two of Links to Labels. John Madera, um, Buena Gente Golf. Really appreciate your time, John. Look forward appreciate to you. seeing your brand continue to grow in the future. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. All right. Take care. We'll talk soon.